Namaste and uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to Canada India Foundation's uh, uh, 25th uh, session of our virtual webinar speaker series on Ayurveda. My name is Satish Thakkar, uh, current chair of Canada India Foundation, and we have uh, Dr. Harish Verma, President, Canadian Ayurvedic Practitioners Association uh, with us. Uh, friends, our special guest of this morning is Ms. Apurva Srivastava, uh, Consul General of India in Toronto, an inspiration and a strong supporter of uh, this uh, speaker series. A very warm welcome, uh, Apurva Ji, for joining us uh, this Thank morning. You. Thank you so and much. Friends, our expert speaker of this morning is Dr. Madan Thangawalu. Uh, he will uh, appraise us on the different aspects of fundamental research for Ayurveda and modern medicine integration. Uh -huh. Uh, welcome, sir. Um, friends, Ayurveda is one of the traditional systems of medicine that practices holistic principles, uh, primarily focused on personalized health. Originated in Bharat, Ayurveda is one of the ancient yet uh, living health uh, traditions. Ayurveda is commonly referred as science of life because the Sanskrit meaning of Ayu is life and Veda is the science or the knowledge. Uh, we all know that a well-designed, rigorous scientific evidence-based research on medicines and therapeutic practices of Ayurveda is necessary. We at CIF created a million dollar research fund with the University Health Network in Toronto and looking forward for an engaged research collaboration to kick off with the All India Institute of Ayurveda India on the chronic diseases like diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular, and kidney. In today's webinar, we'll learn from Professor Tanga Velu uh, regarding the need and different aspects of over 6,000 years old Ayurveda and modern medicine integration for the betterment of human health among the different traditional systems of medicines across the globe it is Ayurveda which has been regaining its past glory and gaining strong acceptance among the communities in the West and North America. The indigenous knowledge about the medicinal plants, well documented in the Ayurvedic uh, literature, has been positively responding to the modern scientific needs. Friends, this Ayurvedic lecture series, series is in partnership with Canadian Ayurvedic Practitioners Association in, in Canada, uh, Consul General of India in Toronto, and uh, Vedic Spiritual Heritage Foundation. Uh, before we begin, let me invite our special guest, uh, Ms. Apurva Shrivastu, who's a career diplomat uh, with over two decades of very illustrious uh, experience uh, working with the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, Indian Embassy in Paris, Kathmandu, and so on and so forth. She is a, a, a vast, vast reservoir of ideas with the sea deep passion to execute them with perfection. And uh, uh, we are very proud, we are very honored uh, to have uh, her leading in Toronto uh, the various initiatives and a great, great supporter of Canada India Foundation. Uh, Madam Apurva Shivastav, thank you for joining this morning and over to you. Uh, we started this initiative almost a year ago, a great inspiration uh, uh, with uh, through her. And today we are concluding this series uh, of 25 session, which we will be announcing the new series in the next year. And uh, Madam, you were there to open up our series. And uh, today we are concluding our first series of 25 session. We are very uh, blessed and uh, honored to have you with us. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Satishji, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, you have also been, it's your personal initiative of these wonderful sessions that have been done and many other things that uh, Canada India Foundation is doing. So namaskar to everyone for joining this 21st session of Ayurveda speaker series. And with today's session, you know, this we have achieved a major milestone in this incredible uh, journey on, of Ayurveda. Uh, uh, as Satish ji told you, I think it was launched uh, in September last year, and uh, uh, and uh, you know, it does, every series 
uh, has helped in, you know, uh, as the presentations made by renowned scholars and practitioners in Ayurveda on various subjects has been very helpful in generating awareness about Ayurveda among the wider population of Canada. On this special occasion, I would like to congratulate uh, Canada India Foundation, your personal leadership, Satish Ji and Ritesh Ji, um, uh, the Canadian Ayurvedic uh, Practitioner Association, Harish Ji, uh, and Vedic Spiritual Heritage Foundation for this sustained effort for making this a uh, very successful series. And I hear that you are starting a new series uh, next year. So congratulations on that. I'm re really looking forward for that. I would also like to welcome our expert speaker for today, Professor Madan uh, Thangavelu, um, who uh, would talk about need for fundamental research for integration of Ayurveda and modern medicines. I, uh, uh, I think this topic is extremely relevant uh, because uh, there's an increasing interest for incorporating elements of Ayurveda into modern medicine uh, to, to treat various chronic uh, disease illnesses. Um, there's also a, a robust uh, conversation about, uh, you know, how to draw the best practices from both modern medicines and Ayurveda. And this presentation, this, this conversation has started uh, in, in Toronto, in Canada, thanks to these speakers series and, and also, you know, the, the endowment, the 1 million endowment that has been created with UHN. So I'm really looking forward for the outcomes for this. Uh, what COVID has taught us that nothing is more important than health. Uh, this has led to change lifestyles and increase in demand for Ayurveda products uh, during the pandemic. And more and more people are now uh, looking towards Ayurveda and organic, uh, for, the, for boosting their immunity. Uh, Canadians have slowly begun to recognize the benefits of accept, accepting Ayurveda as essential part of their li daily life. Maybe not in, in that form and they don't know that it's Ayurveda, but of course they have recognized the benefit. Uh, so we need to work together with both federal and provincial governments um, as at relevant academic and research institutes uh, for, this, for this integration of Ayurveda and modern medicines. Um, we should also look at collaborations that can be entered into to make that Ayurveda studied in Canadian universities as a formal subject and a joint research is conducted for establishing the scientific basis of Ayurveda in, in Canadian universities. Uh, it is for these reasons that Ayurveda speaker series is so very important for delving deeper into various facets of Ayurveda and uh, so that it gives uh, awareness uh, and practice of Ayurveda and enhance its relevance in contemporary society. Uh, with these sessions, we have been able to increase our outreach on Ayurveda to wider community and to a lot of experts. Uh, and I'm sure that this will ultimately pave the way for its recognition in due course of time. Uh, with these words, I would uh, once again congratulate CIF and others for this wonderful initiative and convey my best wishes for continued success of the series and, and for the next series as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, uh, Apuvazi, for your <clears throat> very uh, thoughtful uh, remarks and uh, your strong support to this initiative. Uh, friends, now let me <clears throat> invite our uh, speaker of this morning, uh, Professor Madan Thangavalu. Uh, he is a genome biologist and general secretary research director of European Ayurved uh, Association. As an, an Inlakes founder, a foundation scholar, his PhD in molecular genetics on the genes for the cytoskeletal protein actin was conducted at the erstwhile plant breeding institute Trumpington. Uh, his postdoctoral research experience spans areas in the plant, fungal, uh, bacterial, and human cancer uh, genomics. He, his current primary uh, research interest is in development of single DNA molecule and single cell technique for genome analysis. Following a PhD in molecular genetics, his recent academic affiliations have included a research fellowship at Department of Oncology, University of Cambridge, Medical Research Council Cancer Cell Unit, and Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge. He is International Editorial Advisory Board Member, Ayurcare, uh, Journal of Ayurveda Case Reports, All India Institute of Ayurveda, India. He is honorary adjunct professor at the Transdisciplinary uh, University, Bangalore, India. Uh, he's a member of the Mind Matter Unification Project of the Theory of Condensed Matter Group at Cavendish Laboratory, Cambridge, directed by Professor Brian Josephson. 
Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Tangavalu. We are looking forward to your uh, presentation and over to you. Namaskar. Namaskar ji. Thank you so much, uh, Council General uh, Harish ji, Satish ji, and everybody here today. It's a delight and an honor to be with all of you uh, in this session. And uh, I particularly want to thank Vaidya uh, Harish Verma, who has interacted with me over many years now. And uh, there are several things that I learn from him on a daily basis whenever we chat. So Harish Ji, special thanks to you for not only being patient with me as a student of Ayurveda, but also for introducing me to this uh, wonderful forum. Here in, in London, there is a big initiative that's going on. It's called the uh, Ayush Center, Ayurveda Center of Excellence, ACE. It was established in uh, uh, April 2018 at the Commonwealth Leaders Summit when uh, Prime Minister Modi ji uh, was here. And I, it, I'm hoping that what is happening there in Toronto is, will be something along similar lines. Uh, centers of excellence where Ayurveda and Ayur systems are taken out to the world to show aspects of our Indian systems, uh, the Indian sciences, where uh, there is immense opportunity for interactions between the communities, between the Indian sciences and modern sciences uh, to interactions. perhaps shape uh, a future for the world, a future in terms of not just healthcare, but a new narrative in terms of um, uh, a new narrative in terms of some new values for where uh, health should be. So in my, over the presentation, I would like very much to take you through some thinking that is evolving here in Europe. I'll point you to some of that. The areas in Ayurveda, a few examples where there is immense opportunity for interaction. And finally, the most important point, which is uh, education and uh, research, which is the space that we are uh, 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 discussing today. I have a small number of slides and I will be swift with that. And uh, I will try and convey that in the images and the content of those slides. And hopefully there'll be some time for uh, questions and answers. The, before I set off, I just want to thank my uh, several people who've been interacting with me over the past many years. And um, this is up on my first slide. I, without the help from these people, I wouldn't be able to do all that I'm doing today. So I, I do want to spend a minute just uh, highlighting some of the key uh, players here and the key people here. And, um, the larger narrative that I have here is this one, the One Earth, One Health World Order. And um, I feel there is something here that is important for all of us, um, not just people interested in Ayurveda or people interested in modern medicine or biology, but for all of us as citizens, there is something here that's very important. People who have helped me in this journey and continue to inspire and give me the energy to do what I'm doing now. Uh, starting from the top here, the Ayush Valley Foundation in Kerala, we have a small activity that's been set up uh, in, uh, in South of India. Uh, the Transdisciplinary University in Bangalore, where I am adjunct professor. The European Ayurveda Association based in Germany. Uh, and here in the UK, the all-party parliamentary group on Indian traditional sciences. Uh, we are proud to say that the parliament in the UK has an initiative called the all-party parliamentary group, where we look at the, we bring together people from across the political divide and the APPG on Indian traditional sciences is a very special, it's a very special group. Uh, looking at many, many areas of uh, the Indian trade sciences. I engage uh, with Italy, with one of the small universities in Florence, and also the medical university in Austria, one of the medical universities, the university in Graz, and uh, several other platforms in India 
Ayush Darpan Foundation is an organization that's based in Uttarakhand and the Independent Research Ethics Society based in Calcutta and here in Europe, uh, in Prague, there's a new platform called the Prague Platform. Uh, so this gives you a rough idea of the kind of interactions that uh, inspire me to engage in these matters. The bigger picture that uh, I wish to take you through and the bigger canvas is this One Earth, One Health world order. There is a need felt in many, many places uh, where we need to revision uh, what's called the world order. There are many difficulties uh, and the way things have shaped to where it is today, uh, what we call the age of vaccines and vaccine diplomacy. There is something not right about it. And uh, there is a need to rethink some of the principles that have led to where we are today. And within that are issues of personalized health and care, personalized diagnostics, uh, understanding whether it's DNA-based approaches or refining the traditional Indian systems approaches, and most of all, personal health uh, and a deeper understanding of what we mean by health. And uh, in the context of COVID, how to strengthen our immune system. We have to learn how to, we have to learn to live with this virus. At the heart of all this is the fact that health for the moment, it seems, is being held a hostage of what I call healthcare. Um, I leave it to you to figure out what I mean by healthcare. The only thing I can add here is much of healthcare that we have today is basically disease care masquerading as something else. We seem to have reached a point where there is an overemphasis on disease, and we seem to have completely forgotten what is health. And that is not a very nice state to be in. The impact this has on uh, uh, the medical education is very, very clear. And I put it here using these words that we need to have a complete change in the way we deliver education. And that has to come from better research. Ayurveda and Ayush in the Global Health Dialogue, what is happening here? And uh, there are initiatives like uh, the Ayurveda Center of Excellence here in London, uh, Ayush chairs in different parts of the world. Uh, in Europe, we have a chair in Moscow, a chair in uh, Hungary and uh, in Slovenia. Is that enough? Is there enough traction there with the local governments, with the local students or with the local universities? What is, if there is enough, is it, if there isn't enough traction, what needs to be done? And here are two comments that are uh, drawn from one from a paper. Uh, and you can see Richard Schifrin, who's uh, a department of uh, psychological brain sciences, and he makes a very strong point that we seem to have mastered the skill of gathering data, but we have no idea how to put it together. You know, there's a lot of data, but finding the logic, the rationale, and to make sense of this data is difficult. On the right hand side is a very important book, Causality in the Sciences, and it calls, the, calls for a, a, some kind of integrated thinking about causality. And this is at the heart of the scientific methodology. Ayurveda and Ayush systems need to keep both of these things in mind. On the left-hand side, you will find opportunities because the Ayush systems has a different worldview and a rich perspective. On the right-hand side, are uh, some of the shortcomings. There, we, we are not able to explain in detail some of our uh, uh, outcomes where we get clinical outcomes and we have sometimes find it difficult or the language we use is not quite consistent with uh, what the world expects today. And without this, we cannot reach to where we want to. We want to use, we want to enable that Ayush, for want of a better word, the Ayush prism to arrive at a better narrative about health. And uh, right now, when we look at uh, healthcare, which in most instances disease care, you will find so many hues and colors, you know, specializations, super specializations. What do we do with this? Can we bring some sense into this? And the world 
where does it want to go? The world wants to go towards what we call personalized, predictive, preventive, participatory, and precision medicine. Ayurveda and Ayur systems have all of that within, but somehow we are not able to unpack it, whether it is for cardiovascular disease prevention or for other cases. The bigger canvas that all of this is sitting in is what is making us, I give you in the simplest way, what is making us engage right now. You are sitting in Canada. I'm sitting here in Cambridge in the United Kingdom with a time difference of many hours. And our program is being live streamed on Facebook. And these are the central building blocks of what is yet to arrive, the fifth industrial revolution, where we will be sharing information at great speed and not goods. And this is a power that we haven't quite started uh, appreciating fully, the speed at which we share information and what it's going to do to uh, the future. Health is different from healthcare. In this canvas, we can see on the right-hand side, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that is at the heart of many dialogues and discussions that are going on. On the left-hand side is a small poster that is developed by the Department of animal husbandry and daring, calling, announcing very boldly One Health. And One Health brings together the elements of animal health, human health, environment health. And uh, the, in, in certain places, it might seem India is well ahead of the game. We are bold enough. We have an entire ministry of uh, Ayush. We have departments that are starting to understand how to implement all this. So there are many messages here for the world in terms of thinking continuity, think sustainability, and thinking borderless. And this is where the future is going to be. Now, uh, apologies. Now, when we look within the European community, this is what we see. The European Union has a panel for the future of science and technology. And when you look within their uh, resources, you will find small areas where Europe is also searching for new ways ahead. And I've highlighted just one of the many uh, details available at the website. And uh, 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 the content is what if new drug delivery methods, uh, what if they are, can they revolutionize science? And you will see the kind of uh, points they're trying to get to uh, new COVID-19 treatments or can we treat uh, Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other conditions. And the wish is that the European Union wants to stay ahead of the rest of the world. Now, are we tracking all this correctly? Are we tracking all this correctly? Are we able to follow uh, all of these issues correctly? Uh, are we mature enough to identify these things? When we look across the world, you will find there are nations like Singapore who are already working on it. There is a narrative there. In a recent paper uh, published in September in The Lancet, you will see what Singapore's wishes are. Uh, Singapore wants to go beyond healthcare to health. They want to go beyond hospitals to community, beyond quality to value. And these are all indicators of where uh, Ayush has opportunities and where the messages from the Ayush systems can help. Now, the knowledge that we have is very ancient. It comes from the time of Nagarjuna, very respected scholar for students of Ayurveda. And I've highlighted here uh, on the right-hand side, Nagarjuna's 15 indicators of health. For those who can read the Nagari script in Sanskrit, it says, Tadalakshana Panchadasha Prakara. There are 15 indicators of good health. And when we look at where health should be, there is no major change in uh, uh, what Nagarjuna described to us to where we should be today. And somehow we've forgotten all of these things. Every one of those aspects that Nagarjuna has highlighted there all connect with the best of physiology. He's only talking human physiology, whether it's food, uh, proper, eat, proper digestion, 
uh, elimination of waste, functioning of your sense organs, uh, a tranquil mind, uh, proper sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, this is known to the Irish systems for thousands of years. Nagarjuna came much later in the game, but this is known to Irish for thousands of years. But somehow we are not able to dress this truth for the present time. Also known in different ways and presented in different ways as shown in this poster here, are comments that are made since a long time that to know the nature of man, one must know the nature of all things. Now this resonates very nicely with several elements of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. When things go wrong, this is what happens. Um, shown on the left-hand side, uh, uh, what happened early last year. We were completely at a loss. And what is the way out of this? Are we able to provide immuno health, particularly for the poor people? Are we to be reactive to this or proactive about health? And I think there is a, there is a, there's a, a pointer here that proactiveness towards health is what we want to do, what we want to achieve. When uh, a little virus comes along, it causes major havoc. That number there of about 23 million is a very uh, uh, underestimate. It's more likely that it's closer to about 50 million people who were dislodged from where they were in the cities, working, going back to the cities. And the problems haven't stopped. This is where we are today. We have a new strain that's come out, Omicron. And is this going to stop? Are these strains going to stop being produced? No, highly unlikely there will be new strains. We have to learn to live with this. And if we look within the comments that are being made, I highlight one little bit here, boosting the immune system uh, to compensate for some of the variants, immune evading tricks. Ayush has many, many opportunities for learning about all of this. We do have technology that maps and tracks these mutants, shown here information available at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases in South Africa on a, almost on a daily basis or almost on, a, on an hourly uh, real-time basis. You can see these, but we are not able to offer solutions. Our uh, chief scientist at the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, uh, just two days ago, made these comments that um, we will never be able to understand how these variants come about, perhaps. Um, we may never know when they, where they come from, but we have to learn to somehow find a balance between natural infection as a booster, perhaps using vaccines as a solution, et cetera. The counter narrative that is going on, again, from the Reuters website, is that vaccination is the only way ahead. Uh, I can understand what the sentiments and the reasons for that kind of a, a comment would be, so would you, uh, but is that the only solution? And within that are confusing news items that really uh, generates uh, unwanted anxiety in the community. This is a fascinating story that appeared Friday, 3rd of December from India about a South African traveler who came and he managed to come to India and get out of India. And there's a lot of confusion here about these things. Now, all of this needs to be presented in, a, in a, perhaps in a slightly different language. That one phrase I wish to use is called de-risking. There are too many uh, players in, 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 in the arena who are able to cause confusion. Their motivation is different. Uh, their aspirations and the end goals are different. And sometimes the last thing on their mind is the health of the individual. So there is a responsibility there to de-risk mm -hmm. not just individuals, but from individuals' health all the way upwards to economies, et cetera, et cetera. I've highlighted here for those, in the, the, those who are following us here uh, about the challenges that India faces, the, the, what I mean by you know, health of the poor, and I've highlighted uh, the central state of India, Madhya Pradesh. Now, Madhya Pradesh has a population of about 73 million people. It's about twice the population of Canada. Canada has a land area just under 10 million square kilometers. Madhya Pradesh has an area that is less than three and a half percent the land area of Canada. So in three and a half percent, uh, less of a 3.1 percent the land area of Canada, 
you have about twice the number of citizens all squeezed into. And this is the state for every, this is the uh, nature of population density for almost every state in India. Our total uh, investment on health is a fraction of the research budgets for even single multinational companies. And why is immunohealth for the poor important? Uh, shown here on the left-hand side, a list of the high consequence infectious diseases uh, from around the world, contact HCIDs or airborne HCIDs. There's a long list of these that are waiting uh, to appear at some point. And we need to understand these things. And you need to understand how to fight these things. Shown on the right-hand side are the kind of unexpected surprises for those in the audience who know about uh, uh, aligning protein sequences. They don't need uh, much, uh, there is a need to explain very much of this. But for those who don't know, shown on the right-hand side is a protein sequence alignment. So single letters here indicate the single amino acids in a certain part of the protein. This is a small section of the spike protein. And you can see a very large number of isolates shown here and strange happenings in strange isolates like the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that is causing all the problem. You see unusual fingerprints here of uh, certain changes that seem very, very unusual. They are not, they don't seem very natural. And that causes alarm bells to ring saying, how do these things happen? I leave it there. I don't want to go more into uh, issues of how these things can be generated or how these mutations can be made. But what is clear is that when you take systems of medicine, like we have the Indian systems of medicine or, and the Western system of medicine, and if you were to enable the dialogue between the, where are the tensions and where are those points where you find tension? Shown here is a very simple truth table uh, in, this, in this table, I have highlighted uh, with a cross some unknowns and with a tick mark some knowns, what is known in perhaps in one domain and uh, juxtaposed on the left hand side is uh, knowns and unknowns, again shown with a tick for the knowns and the unknowns. You can see several domains that, that appear when we bring these systems together. And there are many areas when we bring about this kind of engagement between uh, the two systems sciences, where there is no uncertainty about where, uh, there is no confusion between the two sciences. There are some domains shown here as the diagonal running left to the, uh, to the uh, bottom left to the top right, where one side agrees, but the other side is not clear and vice versa. This is an area where there is immense scope for research, uh, mostly basic research using tools and knowledge that is already available in one, but not known to the other. And for me, that very narrow area of fundamental science sits here on the top left corner, where little is known for both the sciences. And I'll, with a few examples as I proceed, I'll take you through uh, what I mean by these two. Now, here is one example. Ayurveda and the Ayush systems uh, recognize a term called Ritucharya. Uh, Ritucharya is certain procedures and recommendations that are expected or expected of you to stay in good health with the change of the seasons. And Ayurveda, the oldest textbooks of Ayurveda talk about this for perhaps over two and a half thousand years. They have known this. When we come into understanding seasons and the changes, you will use, when you use modern biology techniques, this is what you see. Shown here is a paper uh, published in um, 2015 by John Todd and his team, talking about immunity and uh, physiology of the human body with changes in the months of the year. And what, in brief, is when we look at it at the level of gene expression, you will see certain genes that are expressed differently at different seasons. There is a collection of genes that are expressed predominantly during the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere, and their expression goes down as you approach winter. Now, John and his colleagues go on to look at this about 4,000 protein genes, 
and they understand something that looks very much like what is understood in Rutacharya in Ayurveda. And they comment on this by saying the immune system has a profound pro-inflammatory transcriptomic profile. That means the expression of genes during European winters. By European winters, they mean the Northern Hemisphere winters. With increased levels of C I interleukin-6 receptor, this is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, and various other details. I won't go too much into the details here, but that paper was published on the 12th of May, 2015 in Nature Communications. And when we look into the finer details and we look at the mechanisms of how these genes interact and they work, you can see all the details. They don't not only work in the blood cells, but they're also working in the adipose tissue. And more recently, we know they work in every cell in the human body. Now, the second area is a slightly more exciting area, which is to do with what Ayurveda agrees as the dominance of doshas during different periods of the time and what the Chinese medicine system also describes very clearly. Uh, a blueprint of the body's biological clock. Shown on this image, you will see uh, the day divided into quadrants and you will see uh, different activities which are carried out more efficiently at certain times of the day. And uh, work related to that, the cell biology related to that, has even won the 20, 2017 uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine about clocks and clock genes and all of these things. The Chinese understand this in, in their way, and there is a lot of parallels between the Chinese understanding and uh, uh, Indian perception of these systems. Now, if you look at the applications for this, I highlight the work of Professor Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute in California. He says you can lose your weight, you can increase your energy, you can transform your health. Uh, following, if you follow the circadian code, there is a certain code in, in that biological clock. And if you follow that, you sleep well, you lose weight, et cetera, et cetera. His second book published uh, last month, uh, the circadian diabetes code. And he goes on to say that a lot of diabetes can be prevented if you understand these clocks. Now, this is an area that is um, a little bit uh, uh, not too clear, the fine details, not too clearly described in Ayurveda, but understood in modern biology. And there is opportunity for a lot of dialogue. There are researchers in Canada who work on these kind of things, and there's opportunity for interaction. Sachin has gone on to make a smartphone app that you can use and understand where your body is at what time. Another smart app that's come out with the recognition and the support of the WHO is the WHO's mobile yoga app. Now, this is very interesting because it guides you to some of those asanas, et cetera. Now, what's the impact of this? Uh, the impact is predominantly in many of the chronic diseases shown here are two researchers, one from the University of Illinois in, in the States and Wayne State University. And they're looking at yoga and aging for neurodegenerative diseases. And these are exciting areas. Again, there are many researchers in, in Canada who could come into this whole area. The term that is used for all of this is non-pharmacological uh, interventions. And uh, Professor Gregory Nino is here at the University of Montpellier, the oldest uh, medical school in Europe. And he has uh, put together a fascinating book called The Non-Pharmacological Interventions. And the subtitle is An Essential Answer to Current Demographic Health and Environmental Transitions. You will see certain sentiments here that parallel the sustainable development goal sentiments, but to see it coming from the oldest medical university in Europe and from uh, somebody like Professor uh, Gregory Nino, who is involved in cancer work, it is quite refreshing. Now, in terms of other treatment approaches, I want to highlight areas where there are groups starting to recognize the need and the importance of these ancient systems as routine procedures in, uh, for maintaining good health, shown here, uh, a web page from the University of Edinburgh. And the question asked is, can an ancient Asian remedy help prevent the spread of COVID-19? And the procedure is very simple. It's just uh, uh, nasal irrigation and gargling with saline water. 
which in uh, uh, yoga is called Jalneti. If you go into that website, you will see a lot of details of the clinical trials that are being done in, uh, in, in Edinburgh to understand uh, the effect of nasal irrigation on not only, they say, not only COVID prevention, but also uh, COVID cure. Now that's a very important claim that's being made. And one then starts to say, well, is there any other evidence that is available uh, to support this claim? Uh, and I point here to the university, the Medical University of Graz in Austria, and the work that's going the, on there to understand the nose brain axis and the role of bacteria in that part of the nose and the complexity and the dynamics, very much like the gut bacteria, how they affect uh, olfactory function uh, and uh, aspects of good health. Now, if you read around the subject, you will come across a, a, a structure called the NALT system, the nasopharynx associated with lymphoid tissue, shown in this image as this little yellow region. And shown up here is uh, the area where we have the respiratory mucosa and also the microbes that are associated with it. The suggestion here is that if the health of the microbes in this space is in harmony, then you get protections against COVID. Now, this is a very fascinating suggestion. When we look at this area slightly more closely, the workers from the University of Perugia in Italy, they start to give us the mechanisms behind this. Now, early in the talk, I said that sometimes we need mechanisms, we need to understand how things work. And unless we can get the mechanisms, there isn't that credibility that we can have. And in this paper, it gives some indication of that evidence. What is that evidence? What is happening there in terms of mechanisms? And they're pointing to very, very fine detail about the microbes in that part of the nose and the microbes and their influence on certain biochemical pathways shown here in terms of one amino acid tryptophan and the formation of very important uh, biochemical serotonin, melatonin. For biochemists in the audience, they will know what this is. But these are central uh, uh, chemicals that control our physiology. And what they are suggesting is that if the microbiome in your nasopharynx is well, is healthy and well maintained, very much like your gut microbiome, then it offers protection against COVID-19. For people in Ayurveda, they have known this for a long time indirectly. Here is one example of a simple intervention that is used in Ayurveda. Uh, Harish Ji and others, uh, the Vaidyas here, will be able to tell us more about how this um, uh, intervention works. But what is fascinating for me is that there, all of the information here, the Ayurvedic information, what is coming from Perugia, what is coming from the Medical University in Graz, all comes together into a very nice uh, approach for how we might be able to take, uh, to, to be able to find ways to live with this virus. I won't go through this long list of herbs here. In my recent discussion with Harish Ji, he was telling me how to understand these different herbs. But the point I want to make here is that there are interventions that are available and available with, with us for thousands of years. The current uh, experimental evidence points to the microbiome it might be now very, very easy to put all of these strings, uh, threads together and come up with something that helps us uh, understand uh, better ways uh, to protect ourselves, extra layers of protection against this virus. We have to live with this virus. It's not going to go away. Uh, the other area uh, which is very important is long COVID, a complex problem. In America, this uh, the, from the directors, uh, page at the National uh, Center for Complementary Integrative Health is a study pointing to how health workers are affected by uh, long COVID. In the United Kingdom, there are about 1.2 million people who are suffering from this. The National Health Service has established just under 70 centers to look after these people. And in discussions with Baidias, I see this as one area where Ayurveda uh, particularly Ayurveda offers immense, uh, fascinating approaches for managing long COVID. The Vaidyas amongst us 
I think we need to come together to discuss all this further. The complexity and the reasons for long COVID is as seen in the nature of the virus, the different organs it infects, et cetera, et cetera. And it might seem for such complex problems, there is nothing there in modern medicine. They don't understand how to bring to, to appreciate this complexity caused by a very small virus. But Ayurveda, when it looks at the human body in a holistic way, it seems to offer uh, an answer. There are other dimensions of Ayurveda and yoga, and particularly the marma side of uh, Ayurveda yoga, and which all points to how we might be able to unpack why these treatments are effective, not just in terms of just chemicals, perhaps in terms of complex anatomical physiological changes that are going on in the body, particularly inflammation, inflammation of deep-seated uh, organs within the human brain. And how Ayurveda on the right hand side, you can see how Ayurveda and yoga have appreciated certain points in the body, the marma points, and how they are part of the central um, um, aspect of maintaining good health. Any imbalance there can affect in this case uh, the hypothalamus, pituitary, uh, the adrenal axis, and then it can destabilize the whole physiology. Again, there is opportunity for collaborative work in that space. In, in the world uh, scenario, I'm showing you here the, uh, an example from James Gallagher. He's the science correspondent for the BBC and uh, his series of programs here on dirt and development, how the microbes in us set us on a path of health of chronic disease. And James's program, you can locate, uh, he calls it the second genome, and you can locate his programs and listen to him on radio. On radio. The intestinal microbiome is starting to be understood better and better. Just like the nasal microbiome, it seems to have a very, very important role in maintaining our health. This is very well understood using a different language, though, by the Ayurvedic community. They talk about something called Jataragni, and they talk about Krimis, Shakaja Krimi, the term that they use. These are microbes that are within us. The narrative is there, is, is now being recognized by many, many uh, researchers. This is from a recently held um, Congress here in. Uh, in, in London, the European Congress for Integrative Medicine. And there is an improved understanding on uh, aspects of the microbiome, how it influences your uh, immunity. And it is clear there is a very important role. And it's also clear from understanding in Ayurveda that there is a way to modulate this. Uh, so Ayush, uh, uh, the Ministry of Ayush has already offered us something called the Ayush Kada uh, that has a collection of herbs. They're all help, helping in uh, boosting immunity. I think it is this area is ripe for research aspects. Uh, the finer details, again, this is a presentation from the 13th European Congress for Integrated Medicine complete, uh, was held last month in London. It talks about piperlongumin uh, and its effects on finer aspects of blood cells, T cells in this instance, by Professor Yvonne Samstag at the Heidelberg University Hospitals. These are all examples for where the initiative in Toronto can go for the future. I highlight here a very complex formulation, Mahatikta Gridham, which is a very important formulation that's known to Ayurveda community. And you will see uh, Pipli, Piper Longum, uh, that is described by, uh, by uh, the, uh, Dr. Samstag on, in Heidelberg and how you find this in many of the formulations. Some of the effects are known, but much more remains to be understood. Bitter herbs are a part of the European system, shown here, a bitter herb composition that is uh, uh, out from, that's coming out from a small monastery in Austria, and a collection of other bitter herbal formulations that are used uh, very frequently here in, uh, consumed very frequently here in uh, Europe, in many parts of Europe. Now, what is the connection between bitter, uh, bitter compounds and uh, the taste, uh, the taste of bitter and receptors? I show you two uh, examples here. Um, the one on the left is more related to odorant receptors in the microbi uh, microbiome of the nasopharynx, uh, uh, a Nobel Prize awarded uh, early on. And this year's Nobel Prize uh, for Physiology Medicine 
given for just that, for understanding receptors, uh, including bitter receptors, and for temperature and touch. For Ayurveda people, uh, they know that temperature and touch and uh, bitter compounds are the heart of their treatments. And somehow the dialogue between the so-called uh, mainstream uh, Western science and Ayurveda is not happening. So uh, once again, very happy that Canada is uh, taking this initiative forward. Uh, across from Canada into America at the Uniformed Services University, I highlight this little work that is uh, uh, published by uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the Journal of Experimental Theoretical Oncology uh, by late Professor Radha Maheshwari, Professor of Pathology. Now, uh, the university services, uh, the Uniformed Services University is very much on the news with presidents. That's the place where the presidents of America go for their treatments, colonoscopy or treatment for COVID. And uh, Radha Maheshwari ji was there and he talks about a very important herbal formulation, Brahma Rasayana, and how this can be used in his, at least in his experimental model for tumor uh, growth, for cancer management. And he goes on to say that these are very uh, inexpensive preparations that have little or no adverse side effects with the potential as lead chemopreventive compounds and which might prove useful for treatment of disorders such as human prostate cancer. Very powerful statement made by late Professor Maheshwari. And, uh, there are many lessons for us when we look at developing research programs for the future. Now, moving into the fundamental area, I want to highlight an example uh, of a program that was established quite some time ago between India and Italy. And uh, it's called the India Trento Partnership for Advanced Research. And the study here is about something called the Sanskrit effect. When you take pundits who are reciting large uh, can remember and recite large numbers of um, uh, uh, large texts and many lines of Sanskrit. And when they compare the brains of these people, you find uh, unusual uh, uh, changes in different parts of the brain of a pundit compared to uh, 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 normal uh, humans who don't have this ability, who haven't practiced long enough. I highlight this just to point towards how uh, advanced research program can be framed. And uh, this clearly is an old initiative from July, 2003, but what has come out of it is very exciting. Very, um, in May this year was uh, a paper published from India, from Bangalore and Lucknow, talking about the Sanskrit effect and how extensive long-term verbal memory training is associated with plasticity. Now, within this are deeper sciences, fundamental sciences, and uh, how come there is an interaction between how you recite things and how it affects the brains. It's been told in the Indian systems that these uh, uh, recitation will give you special skills, but how it happens, we are only just starting to see the glimpse of uh, the early signs of where we can see changes in the body. Yoga has known for a long time about uh, other ways of describing the human anatomy. So shown on the center here is anatomy and uh, neuroanatomy as described in Western medicine and shown flanking that image are descriptions that is known in, in yoga. Now, for, there are textbooks about this, there are practitioners who understand all of this, but we don't know how to explain this in contemporary language. Uh, there is some work going on. I highlight here one research paper that comes from the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research in Kalpakam in uh, Tamil Nadu. And this is one of the finest studies I have seen to date on measurement of biomagnetism. Now, if you go back to the previous slide, you, there are descriptions of some energy that runs within the human body. And we are starting to see how we might be able to measure this. But to make these measurements, you need to have extremely sensitive measurement devices. In this instance, the Josephson Junction, which is used in uh, measuring things. And uh, also the fine measurements that will come out if you are able to mask the Earth's magnetic field and uh, start to measure biomagnetism. So shown here 
you will see on the right hand side, I would just uh, expand it a little bit. I draw your attention to the little graph here on the right hand, far right hand side. And if you, if you look at this graph, what you will see uh, something very interesting, which is um, that the magnetic measurements, the biomagnetism that you measure, it is so fine that there is a difference in uh, what you can measure when the eyes are closed or when the eyes are open. Now, this is the level of sensitivity with which uh, you, can, um, you can make things understand the complex biology. People then say, well, what is the physics behind this? And shown here uh, is the work from Herbert Froelich about the signs which points towards the potential signs of the meridians and these energies. Now we can measure biomagnetism. We know how it's generated in the human body and we might even have the theory for this. Um, the larger concepts are understood in uh, aspects in general term called coherence. Biological systems are very ordered structures and uh, biological order can give rise to new properties and uh, biological systems and, uh, and it's also possible to measure these things. We might be able to, or this might be the way to understand some of the problems that are ongoing with COVID. There are suggestions that we, these might even provide future uh, treatments for COVID. As I come to the very end of my presentation, I just want to highlight a few points that have been given to us by physiologists here, Dennis Nobel, uh, sometime cardiovascular uh, physiology professor at the University of Oxford. The 10 points that he touched on are very important. He says transformation of information is not one way. And this is very, very important when we talk about the effect of the environment on human health. So there could be something much more than the usual things that we talk about, that is chemicals or pollutants, etc. There might be some other things that is beyond our senses that affects uh, our health and well-being. And I won't read, go through all the 10 points. You can locate them at the Wikipedia page, Dennis Lobel's Wikipedia page. He goes on to say there are many more rules yet to be discovered and the genuine theory of biology does not exist yet. In 2009 in Milan, in Italy, we got together discussing Ayurveda, the meaning of life awareness, environment and health. It was an event that was well ahead of its time in many ways. And we were fortunate to have Professor Brian Josephson with us, uh, who's one of our Nobel laureates here in physics. And he has been engaged, he's been engaging with Eastern philosophy, Western science for a long, long time. And Brian goes on to say about reality, he says, it's too complex. There are too many factors, there are too many unknowns, and we might not be able to get to the bottom of uh, all of that complexity uh, so quickly. There is no way to reduce this. Uh, there might be a need for a new way, a new worldview to understand um, this complexity. Now, what is the significance of all this? So on one hand, we have modern science that has developed new tools, uh, both in India and elsewhere. There are fascinating new tools, for, for instance, for generating biomagnetism, uh, or with the ancient sciences, we have a wealth of knowledge. Uh, when I sit and look through, flick through Charaka Samhita, I get the feeling this textbook, which is the most recent redaction, which is about two and a half thousand years old, is ahead of its time. Are we using all that, the possibilities effectively in global health and care? And what is needed, uh, or perhaps what is needed is some kind of, what I, the phrase I use, Ayush diplomacy for building better global health. And there are readily identifiable areas, uh, uh, infectious diseases, what we are hit with now, non-communicable diseases, several, mental health, where um, uh, there are aspects uh, that are additionally uh, uh, troublesome because of the ongoing uh, COVID problems. So there are many, many areas where uh, Ayush can do. 
India is already doing, uh, taking the big lead in all of this. Ayushman India is a very, very important program uh, initiated in India. We have aspects of essential drugs that are highlighted now in the Ministry of uh, uh, Ayush web pages for Ayurveda, Siddha, Unani, homeopathy, etc. Uh, India has curated, look through the old text, currently has this traditional knowledge digital library, which is about with over uh, approximately almost 300,000 complex formulations, all waiting to be understood and rediscovered. Uh, we have uh, uh, Old herbs like guruchi shown here, tinospora, cordifolia, and what is difficult to understand the controversy within the country about these things highlighted here, a news item from India today. A dialogue that should happen between the modern sciences and the ancient sciences, it might seem is not even happening in India. There are valuable uh, medicines like simple formulations like trikatu, which are in fact uh, very powerful medicines with side benefits. I like to use the word as side effects. These are things that give you benefits. Uh, foods with side benefits, kichadi is one that everybody knows about. Where are these discussions going on elsewhere? I just want to show you one of the events that's going on uh, uh, that was concluded recently, the World Health Congress in uh, September this year in Prague. Please do visit this website. And the logo that we've offered there, the byline here, is that health uh, knows no boundaries. And one of the outcomes of the September meeting is one of, possibly one of the ways forward, which is to catalyze and grow Citizens' Global Health Policy Pact, which is a citizen to citizen interaction to discuss health and well being systems globally. If you go into the, uh, the web pages of the Prague platform, you will access all the talks that took place over the uh, two and a half day sessions. And we are bold in saying that it's not just disease that knows no boundaries. We are bold enough to say that health also knows boundaries, knows no boundaries. And we, uh, that's a time, it's a time for change. The biggest challenge in all this is education. And uh, practice, of course, is challenging. Uh, John Hewlins Jackson mentioned this, that sometimes it takes 50 years to get a bad idea out of medicine and 100 years to get a good idea in. This the words given to us almost 120 odd years ago still remains true. It's very difficult to change practice, but it can be done. Uh, education for sustainable health and care. There are many resources that are coming out from around the world and the list is down here, uh, very, very uh, impressive titles uh, called Planetary Health Alliances uh, or Education for Sustainable Healthcare uh, or uh, the Nurses uh, Drawdown, et cetera. There are a lot of resources. Perhaps it's time to bring all this together uh, and to engage uh, with them from an Irish perspective and also from the perspective of a Irish world order, a new, new world order in terms of health. Uh, this is again a paper presented at the recently concluded European Congress for Integrative Medicine uh, from workers in Germany talking about interprofessional collaboration, another valuable area that will bring a little more discussion into areas of health about other systems of medicine. In Germany from the University of Tübingen is Professor Stephanie Jewell's work on developing a competency catalog for all of Germany. And this is a very exciting thing because there is a feeling there that there is something missing in contemporary medicine. And there is also a lot missing in how to deliver it to the students. So Stephanie's work is important. There are discussions going on. There are many centers where complementary alternate medicine research goes on, shown here across Europe. Uh, at the link, you can see all these details. There's an opportunity for dialogues with these groups and to draw them into the discussion. Sidney Brenner, uh, uh, one of our uh, genome uh, bio uh, biologists and uh, the discoverer of the uh, genetic code here in Cambridge, tell, uh, would remind us constantly that you know, the endless quest for knowledge will continue. Uh, and he always said, you know, I want to learn. I've done so much for biology, but I need to learn something more. And that something more might be 
might have to come from teaching biologists another language. Uh, uh, paraphrased his comment by saying not only biologists, but also doctors, uh, a new language. And I feel in my heart that Ayurveda offers that new language. And the time has arrived to make those connections. Here in Europe at the University of uh, Latvia in Riga, shown here is the work uh, uh, directed by uh, uh, Dr. Valdis Pirag, um, uh, who has set up the University of Latvia International Institute for Indic Studies. There's a lot of discussion going on uh, for the Baltic nations and work that is going on in India at the Benares Hindu University. There's a very large mission that just came to uh, conclusion now, recently from the Ministry of Human Resource Development um, from the Government of India, the Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya National Mission on Teachers and Teaching. There is immense opportunity uh, for engaging with researchers of this kind. Clearly the WHO uh, traditional medicine strategy is there in Geneva and there's, there's a lot of work going on there. I mentioned about the M Yoga project, the mobile yoga app that's there. Now this current strategy runs till 2023. What happens after that? Uh, perhaps the initiatives like what's happening here in the UK and what's happening in, uh, in Evolve in Canada can all be brought together to bear, uh, to provide some new direction into where uh, the future should be for the next uh, traditional medicine strategy. Uh, WHO Center of Excellence is coming up in Jamnagar in Gujarat. So there are things happening, but I think if people come together, much, much more can be done. For those who are interested, uh, coming Tuesday, 7th of December, from the Lakshmi Metal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University, is a very interesting uh, session that is uh, uh, hosted by uh, universities in uh, Pune, two universities, um, and uh, the, the Transdisciplinary University where uh, Sri Darshan Shankarji will be talking about the healing properties of Ayurveda and Ayush medicine. Please do join those webinars. In terms of other initiatives, this is an example of what is what discussions that are going on between Austria, France, and the European Ayurveda Association with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. This was uh, uh, an event that was hosted in uh, fe February 2019 about next generation physiology for healthy lifestyle and physiology for good health and prevention of non-communicable diseases. There's an opportunity to develop many more such programs for the future. Now, as I conclude, I just want to point out uh, there are disconnects and Ayurveda shows and tells us that we must engage with these uh, certain areas, whether we like it or not, because we are only an extension of the environment. And this was a report of the WHO Commission of Health and Environment published in note, it was published in 1992. It's taken a long time for this report to be accepted and to be put into action. I hope that with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and with the growing presence of IU systems within WHO Geneva, we'll be able to add a little more energy to all of this. So I finish off there. I thank you so much for your attention and thank you so much for inviting me to be with all of you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Thangabelu, and for such a, such a very inspiring, uh, very deep uh, presentation on what, what is happening in the rest of the world on Ayurveda and, uh, um, you know, the science of India, ancient uh, wisdom of India. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, Dr. Verma, over to you for, for some uh, Q&A. I know a, a, a timing of an essence uh, um, we're running, but I think today's... Uh, Concluding session, we are taking liberty to extend this session a little longer. And thank you for uh, thank you for giving me the chance to have this extended. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, we enjoyed we enjoyed thoroughly. Dr. Verma, over to you. Uh, thank you, Stacey. Thank you very much. So, first of all, I am thankful to respected CG Apurva Shrivastavji, with whose support and blessings we have completed first phase of her. 25 lectures of uh, Ayurveda series. And as Tishi mentioned, we will be starting next series soon in coming year, next year. And I'm thankful to CIF, 
Sreesh ji, Ritesh ji, and all members of CIF for adding Ayurveda in their main objective. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, now coming back to today's lecture, Dr. Madan ji, thank you very much for your wonderful and insightful presentation. I'm so excited you have touched all points why there is a need for integration, why, how it can be integrated, and what are the benefits, what are the methods. In such a short time, you have given us such a vast knowledge that I'm highly thankful to you, I'm obliged. Now, as uh, Sthishji has mentioned in his opening remarks that we are trying to bridge the gap between Ayurveda and modern science, and to to fill the gap or to bridge the gap, uh, CIF is trying uh, to write, uh, to develop a MOU between UHN and uh, Ayush. So it will be done very soon. And Dr. Danji will take your help in bridging the gap between modern science and Ayurveda. And you are genius, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Over to CG. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And uh, yes, um, uh, I would definitely echo what uh, Dr. Verma has just mentioned, <clears throat> that we are uh, trying to create an ecosystem within the modern science and uh, modern medicine and with the, the practice of our Ayurveda, that how we can uh, uh, cover the gap. And we have uh, created a research fund for that and endowment for that purpose. And uh, we're looking for, forward, you know, a uh, person like yourself to uh, help uh, and supporting uh, that initiative because your experience, wisdom, and uh, uh, what is happening in the rest part of the Europe and other parts of the world is very, very important when we, we are carrying forward that dialogue. And uh, definitely we look forward to uh, staying you know, connected with you and keeping you engaged on, uh, we'll borrow more time, time from you. Uh, I know you are very busy, uh, uh, but we'll borrow and request some more time uh, uh, on, on Canada front and looking forward to a, a continuous uh, uh, engagement from you, sir. I've, uh, I've enjoyed, thank you. Now, number one, thank you so much for uh, drawing me into your activities in Canada. And the one point I highlighted was about the fifth industrial revolution, where what we are seeing is the early days of this revolution. You know, people are already talking about telehealth and people are talking about teleconsultations, et cetera. That's just the early days of uh, the fifth industrial revolution. There will be a huge flow of information between people of the world. You know, the granularity at which this interaction happens will be from individual to individual. And that is very, it's, it's very exciting. And some, I think the platform that you have created there, the Canada India Foundation, and the initiative that you've started, uh, the promises you have now had from the governments of India and uh, uh, particularly the initiatives in Toronto, I think these are going to be very, very important for the future. In, uh, in uh, the, the Indian diaspora in this part of Canada is very, is very special in that you have maintained the tradition. You are a very close-knit community. You keep these old traditions and systems alive there. And it's a very, uh, it's going to be a very important uh, uh, home for growing this future. Uh, and with technology that was not available, say three decades ago, two decades ago, the speed at which we are going to come together and the speed at which we can bring about um, new interactions uh, will be exciting. There are several, uh, I, I see a lot of valuable comments from people. Thank you so much for um, sharing the thoughts and uh, the, the comments on the chat box here. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, Satishi, if there so, are. Yeah, yeah, so there's one have time, question, sir. Yeah, so there is one question that if you could share your insight about the uh, public awareness in each country on, on uh, Ayurveda and... Thank you. Uh, this is from my good friend Rajan Ji, Rajan Patangarji, who's a fourth generation Vaidya, located in Mumbai. Rajan Ji, Namaskar. Um, 
opinion about public awareness in each country. You know, what is Rajanji's question is very important because um, even uh, how to address this, even within India, we have a problem. Uh, so that is the first point I want to say, that the understanding of the subtleties, the details, the, 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 the finer elements of Ayurveda is not known within the modern medicine community in India. Now, Ayurveda is easy, especially for people like yourselves, Rajanji, where you've had four generations of Ayurveda in your family, or for somebody like Harishji, who's had, again, many generations of Ayurveda in the family. But what about the common man? Um, so this question is very important. I feel much more can be done. Uh, much more can be done at the, not at the government to government level, but at the people level. And it will be platforms of this kind where you will enable those exchanges. Maybe just conversations, you know. Maybe one of the things the, Canada India Foundation, when you initiate, when you bring together the Ayurveda initiative, should be just a platform for people to engage, just the citizens to engage, you know, just to come and chat. And we could have this is a, what we have today is a slightly more formal uh, situation. It must be slightly more informal. It must be something where uh, Vaidya can talk to people, you know, just about health, just about not about disease, maybe just about health. And the, and, and the messages that are there in the Irish systems. What is how to do pranayama, for instance, you know, something, some very simple things. What are the benefits of Trikatu? Harish Ji was talking, we were talking two days ago about Trikatu and the, the benefits of Trikatu. Uh, simple things. And, and these, are, these are not expensive formulations, but the moment somebody consumes it, they get it, they see the effect. And that level of dialogue should happen. And once that dialogue happens, uh, you can then start to engage with people. You know, people feel that they have something in their hands. And I feel my correct my way to answer Rajendi's question is at that level. And we still we are still missing those platforms where we bring we have just a dialogue with people saying, okay, this is an open house. Come and talk to us about whatever you have. What, what if, even if you are healthy, you are a healthy 50-year-old, come and talk to us because we want to know whether you know how to modulate your life for the next decade when you become 60. How are you going to modulate your lifestyle when you become 70? And those are things you have to start now. And Ayurveda offers you that logic. Ayurveda Systems offers you that logic. Uh, li uh, health across the life course. Uh, when there's a... a uh, uh, a pregnant mother uh, and the child is there, how do you, what are the messages they can have that will give a healthy pregnancy and a healthy uh, newborn? There are many simple messages there. You know? And I think, Rajanji, so my uh, answer to your question is, if we identify those kind of simple areas, you know, where we are looking at people's needs, uh, we are not looking at the far end of cancer treatment, or we are not looking at uh, reversing cardiovascular disease, but simple things, you know. Uh, what are the foods you eat? Are you aware of how you should change your food habits as you get older? And look? What are the foods you shouldn't, uh, you should avoid? What are the kind of, you know, food related things? What do you mean by clean food? Sattvic ahar, what is this thing? You know? Sattvic ahar, what is the meaning of sattvic ahar? So simple dialogues like that. And maybe from there, once people understand, okay, this is doing me some good, they might want to learn a little more. That is my, uh, Rajanji, that's my answer to your, your question. I hope, uh, I, hope, I hope it's convincing. I hope it touches on some of the uh, aspects of uh, uh, what you want to know about public awareness in, in different countries. Uh, I have a question here about the circadian code and my email address. So uh, uh, shall I answer that one, Satishji? Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, if they need any further information, they can connect with CIF and we'll be happy to okay. share it. Okay. I'm curious to, Satishji, from my side, I'm curious to learn a little more about 
the big program that you are contemplating with the university health network and which is very exciting you know and uh, how soon you can share that message with the work here in london and other locations and maybe other parts of europe we uh, before we came on, online we were discussing about this of how to form these networks and how to strengthen those networks so you know i will now take this message on to many people here in europe saying watch uh, cif is doing something very exciting with the university health network in, uh, in toronto and we need to learn a little more uh, and also take messages from europe maybe from the university of grants from austria we'll try and connect with you or from the uh, university of tubingen we will try and connect with you in terms of medical curriculum and we'll try and connect with university of pune or transdisciplinary university in bangalore so those kind of networks can be formed quite easily i think i want to see if this is something that you will be uh, that cif will uh, have uh, an interest in or um, uh, absolutely sir uh, uh, healthcare has been a very very uh... Uh, favorite subject for uh, Canada India Foundation, and we've been hosting various healthcare summits. Uh, we hosted uh, this our third healthcare summit this year, and uh, this initiative was as a result of that healthcare uh, summit as one of the takeaway that we announced this initiative. Um, uh, in terms of the modalities or the operational part uh, uh, moving forward, so first step is like we are formalizing the memorandum of understanding between uh, UHN and All India Institute of Ayurveda, which we'll sh share in next uh, uh, short while. And then our purpose is to, uh, you know, form, formulate a some uh, steering committee to look at it as you rightly said it, what the low hanging fruits are. Of course, we are targeting, you know, bigger scheme of things in the uh, management side of it, but what preventative or maintaining the good health where the low hanging foods are fruits are where we can uh, capitalize on and our objective is to uh, kind of a steer uh, the discussion uh, bring international community together uh, on on this initiative so that any place on this earth if we are finding some uh, you know good uh, results or some 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 kind of a feedback which can uh, be shared uh, as as you rightly said it's a people to people connect uh, health has no boundaries it's it's a boundaryless so uh, it's very and particularly uh, you know in the covid era we have uh, learned uh, it very very hard that we are not immune no matter which country or which boundary you are sitting uh, you, you have no uh, kind of immunity uh, from uh, disease coming from far away and uh, kind of a uh, affecting you. So we have to be uh, very much connected. And uh, for that purpose, the uh, presentation which you uh, shared, sir, were very, very informative, how we can <clears throat> uh, continue with that kind of a dialogue, bring awareness uh, among the masses, uh, one at the public at large, through this uh, Ayurvedic speaker series, one uh, initiative was uh, one effort, uh, small, I can say so, was to raise that awareness uh, among the public uh, uh, in, in Canada at large, uh, which I think we have been successful uh, as our speaker series is not only uh, done, uh, has been uh, on the Facebook live and other social media live, but we have a few uh, media channel also who are covering our uh, uh, message through their uh, TV channels, so it's going across Canada. So that's that's uh, uh, kind of a uh, effort which we want to ramp up in uh, 22, uh, moving forward, and with the support of uh, uh, all of our accomplished uh, uh, speakers, uh, including yourself, sir. We are looking forward to a a, a new, uh, I think, uh, uh, scaling the new heights uh, next year. So Dishi, you, thank you for mentioning uh, what you said. I want to, I'm just holding up here. Uh, I hope the reflection, I hope it's not, I hope you can see this. Yes. I will share, I will share this. This is just like the Council General of Toronto is hosting an event. This is a wonderful event that was held, again, it's a health care conference. 
that is held uh, and sponsored by the Council General in Birmingham here. You know? And uh, it, I will share a copy, a PDF of this document with uh, Harish Ji and yourself. And there are initiatives like this. And if you come together, you see, then we have a, a pan-continental event, you see, yes. between Europe and, uh, and, and uh, North America. And that will be quite amazing. So this, the, the phrase that you used, the healthcare conference, I think here is an example. And they managed to bring together a large, so this was a hybrid conference. Some people didn't have to travel from India. And some of the key people, the director general of the Indian Council for Medical Research, uh, Bhargavji, he came here, he was here at this event. So there, is a, there are new creative ways of bringing things together. You know? And uh, uh, it, it's easier, the, the new formula that we have and how we are discussing here brings all of this, uh, puts a new energy into and the speed into uh, the possibilities for the future. Absolutely, and we would also be more than happy to share with you, sir, uh, our publication for the Healthcare Summit. We've been hosting every alternate year a Healthcare Summit, and we'd love to have more uh, you know, participation uh, uh, from uh, your side. And uh, we'll put you on, on our email list, so you are, keep, yeah. uh, you are kept abreast on the different activities, and let's all work together, uh, pay our, uh, you know, dues uh, in bringing good health and well-being to every everyone. So, Dushi, I see a question here from, uh, again, another person I recognize, uh, Vaishna Ravindran. And Vaishna's question, Vaishna is an MD student in uh, Panchakarma at uh, Kotekel Ayurveda College. Kotekel is one of the citadels of uh, Ayurveda in India based in Kerala. And uh, Vaishna's question is, how can an Ayurvedic student be a part of these integrated platforms that you mentioned? I think exposure to such kind of integrated knowledge early in student life would help us to contribute more. Uh, Vaishna, thank you for uh, pointing, for raising this and for phrasing it so elegantly. Mm -hmm. I think the point I made about education is important. And within that education aspect, Clearly, our students, younger, younger students, I, if it was left to me, and if I could convince CIF, what I would suggest is to have uh, at least a platform for an exchange program. Uh, so it could be a platform for an exchange program between Canada and India, let us say. And it might be to take Ayurveda students from Kerala, or India to Toronto and uh, University Health Networks and to take young medical students from Toronto and Canada to India or to Kerala, you know. And I think it's, the, it's for the young people then to dialogue with young people and develop the foundation for the next uh, layer of engagement. For instance, I think Vaishna, that is my uh, my reply to your question. We are working on this. We would like to we would like very much to see more young mind engagement um, and younger people coming out, learning new techniques, new technologies, and sharing what you know uh, to people not only in a different discipline but in a completely new land. I admire the uh, Indian diaspora in Canada. They are there for in some instances, generations now. They live with the land, a lot of people who came earlier and they have established themselves in the community and they still maintain the valuable Indian traditions. And they are now in a position to engage with policy dialogues and to make, uh, bring about change at the so this is, this is wonderful. And I think we, if we have more of this happening, especially at the level of students, this will be quite wonderful. So Vaishna, you thank you for your question. Uh, that's what is on my mind. I've offered what is on my mind to Satish Ji, just as a suggestion. And I think we'll be able to crystallize something out of uh, these early talks. Absolutely. And to add to uh, uh, Professor Madan's point, uh, Vaishna, you can write to us because one of our, uh, 
key item for, for the discussion uh, with the UHN was that how we can bring uh, more intern when we proceed on this uh, research basis. So there would be an opportunity for recruiting various students in, into this uh, effort. And please do write to us uh, uh, at Canada India Foundation. So I, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Varma, uh, we should conclude today's session. Uh, we have uh, gone uh, almost an, uh, half an hour, extra <laughs> one hour, but I think uh, all of our audience will forgive us for that. And uh, first and foremost, a very sincere thank you, uh, Professor Madan uh, Thangi Bailu, for uh, your, your time and uh, your wisdom and sharing your uh, presentation. It was excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, you know, one of the best one, I, I would say, we have uh, gone uh, so far. And uh, we sincerely uh, thank you from the bo bottom of our heart on behalf of Canada India Foundation, Canadian Ayurvedic Practitioner Association, um, Vedic Spiritual Heritage Foundation. We sincerely thank you. And uh, uh, of course, this initiative was uh, actually started uh, when we had a, a discussion with Consul General of India in Toronto, uh, Apurva Shirvastava, and uh, that's how then Dr. Harish Verma, I had a discussion with him. He's, he's a strong, strong pillar of uh, uh, this uh, effort. And uh, we both uh, uh, sincerely thank uh, uh, our, our Consul General Apurva Shirvastava for supporting wholeheartedly to this uh, uh, initiative. And along with all the staff at uh, at Consul General of India in Toronto, uh, as well as the Ministry of Ayush. We got a great support from Ministry of Ayush. Uh, our media partner on this Y channel, who has been from day one, uh, Pravasi Media, uh, supporting our uh, initiative and uh, uh, taking live broadcasting to various, uh, you know, all the audience in Canada. We sincerely thank them. And to all our uh, participants, all our audience, uh, thank you. Uh, please do write to us uh, your feedback uh, uh, as we are uh, kind of a planning our next series. Any ideas you have, you would like to share with us. We'll be sharing uh, the detail about our uh, new series early next year. Uh, but we're looking forward to your feedback and uh, look forward to crafting the program accordingly. And we'll continue this dialogue and this series uh, uh, in the years to come as our motto is that uh, health is wealth and through Ayurveda and through our uh, you know, ancient wisdom, wisdom, how we can bring uh, good health and well-being to each and every one of us. Uh, that's the key objective. Uh, with that, I thank you all and uh, stay safe, stay well and namaskar. And uh, we are almost approaching towards the conclusion of uh, 2021 as well and uh, wishing yeah. you all a very happy holiday season and a very very happy new year uh, new year as well thank you and bye for now namaskar, namaskar.